This is Morecambe Seafront in the summer of 1901. It was filmed by two pioneering filmmakers from Lancashire. Eight hundred of these remarkable short films were recently discovered in the basement of a shop in Blackburn. But they were nearly lost forever. The films of Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon take us to the world of ordinary people a hundred years ago. They catch them going about their daily lives, leaving work, watching football, catching a tram in the rush hour. These films by Mitchell and Kenyon, who are based here at Blackburn, offer a unique glimpse into a remote Edwardian world. We'll look at life in the city, life at work, in an age before the cinema existed. But what interests me in particular are the people who appear in these films. What can these films tell us about their lives? At the beginning of the 20th century, these early film moguls ran their business from the back of a shop, marketing themselves with the slogans, local films and we take them and make them, Mitchell and Kenyon bought into a brand new technology, moving pictures. In this series, we're going to look at the unlikely story of these Lancashire businessmen and explore their films to find out what they can tell us about life a hundred years ago. The films that Mitchell and Kenyon shot were of local people and local events. They weren't meant to be documentary records of the time, but were made purely for commercial reasons. Seeing yourself on screen was an amazing and almost magical event in those days, and people paid just to see themselves. What's fascinating for a modern audience is how much the films reveal about the people in them. Of course, as always, the more you look, the more you see, the more you begin to get the language of the age, you can decipher and understand and read the people in an almost eerie manner, actually. People loved being filmed. For many, it would be their only chance to be recorded for posterity. Though not everyone was so keen. Today, we're used to being observed and documented. Security cameras, bank transactions, driving licenses dental records. In 1900, things were very different for ordinary working people. They um, had birth certificates, death certificates, marriage licenses would be recorded. But otherwise, not much. These people could lead their whole lives and leave very little trace behind. <laughs> But we have managed to track down the descendants of some of the people in these films. To see my great-grandfather um, playing rugby um, in 1901 is just absolutely amazing. To see him running around, um, a man who was born 90 to 100 years before I was born, a man who died before I was born, to actually see him physically doing things is just incredible.
This is the Batley rugby team from Yorkshire. Mick Judge's great-grandfather, Paddy Judge, was a second row forward. Theo, your great-great-granddad's on here. He is. There he is, just going through now, just before the fellow with the silly scrum cap. It's just bizarre that this match, 103 years ago near enough, and watching it like you're watching it today almost. I just can't believe that <laughs> I really can't get over the fact that they're wearing belts with the shorts. And it's just incredible. And that the referee looks like he's dressed up for some sort of country walk rather than anything else. Looks like he's got you know, probably plus fours or wellies or something. Here I am watching the film with my year old son on my knee and here's the family stretching all the way back. You don't imagine that a member of your family who's not famous, who's not a politician or royalty or a hero or anything like that, it's, it's almost unbelievable to see them moving around, to see them in the flesh in that sort of situation. Between 1897 and 1913, the partnership of Mitchell and Kenyon made hundreds of these films. When the business finally folded in the 1920s, the original negatives were packed away in the basement of the shop. In 1994, after the shop had changed hands many times, builders were gutting the premises. Beneath the ears of accumulated rubbish were three large metal containers, which were about to be dumped on the skip. One man, local optician and film enthusiast Peter Worden, was fascinated by Mitchell and Kenyon's work. He was convinced that the films were lost somewhere in the shop. Fortunately, the builders looked inside the containers. They then contacted Peter Worden to see if he thought the films were worth keeping. It occurred to me that this could very reasonably be the Mitchell and Kenyon films. And indeed, it, it was. And then the task began of organising it and sorting it. So the problem then was what to do with the material because how does one store over 850 rolls, as it turned out, of nitrate film, which of itself is highly inflammable? So then I thought, well, the most logical place to put these would be in as well-controlled a temperate environment as I could reasonably lay my hands on. and arrangements were made to transfer the material to the British Film Institute, who obviously had far greater capabilities than I could ever even begin to aspire to. The British Film Institute stored the films in their vaults at the National Film and Television Archives Conservation Centre in Berkhamsted. The painstaking process of preserving and restoring the 800 negatives for the nation began. The films were shot on nitrate stock, which is notoriously flammable. The fact they were stored in a cool place for 80 years probably saved them from deteriorating completely and had to be stored in a safe place before they could be restored. The storage cells are made out of reinforced concrete and have steel doors, all very bunker-like. Now, let's go into one of the cells. This is where things get particular.